Hey Optimancers, Chris here. Wild Shape is cool. Turn into a ferocious beast, roar, and tear your enemies to shreds. Wild Shape is the iconic druid feature, but only the moon druid enhances the feature to make it much of a combat option. This is the start of a series of videos I'll be doing that focus on optimizing Wild Shape. Or at least it's kind of the start, as I did a bit of a preview going over the classic Barbarian build, where I discuss the strengths of the build, but I also detail the issues you have after level 4. I want my Wild Shape focus character to still be Wild Shaping at high levels, and the Barbarian multiclass just doesn't accomplish that. Before we get into optimizing the feature though, we need to know exactly how it works mechanically. And that's actually a problem, because full disclosure, there's quite a number of things about Wild Shape I don't fully understand or I can't make sense of. There's one part I think really doesn't make sense. So in today's video, we're diving into the weeds and figuring out how Wild Shape even works. And I expect that you'll find after we actually go through the rules that maybe you'll figure you don't fully understand it either. Then again, maybe I'm wrong. If you do know how Wild Shape works, then please enlighten the rest of us because some of the rules for Wild Shape have me scratching my head. I figured out how all handle these things, but you, and more importantly, your DM, maybe haven't even thought about this stuff before. So that will be the topic of this video, and in future videos, I am going to be going through how we can optimize this feature, and eventually, we'll be getting into some actual builds. If you enjoy my content and you would like to support it, please find the link to my Patreon page in the video description. Patrons see these videos early and without the YouTube ads, and there's a bunch of rewards. Check out my Patreon page to find them all, and one of them is a video callout, as these people are about to receive. Aaron Collar, Rob Reichelp, Awesome Face, Benjamin, Bloody Nine, Brett McDowell, CJ, Dash Panther, Dave Peters, David Lotz, David W. Skibbins, Drew Terry, Gakumaru, Horby, Ian Johnson, James Thomas, Jad Zan, Jonathan Luxie, KJ Aurelio, Kurt Chi, Lee LeMay, Laferja, Marlon Rooks, Nathaniel McCauley, Nick Lutz, Nick Simmons, Ryesquai, Sajan Abraham, Sam S., Scott Dunnington, Scott Shields, Steven Edmondson, TUM, Tom Tom, Victor Klassen, and Zachary Shapiro. Thanks all so much for your support. Let's get started. Okay, so here we go. Wild Shape. Starting at second level, a druid can use their action to magically assume the shape of a beast that they've seen before. They can use the feature twice and regain expended uses when they take a short or long rest. Now this already presents an issue, though it's not the main issue I'm focusing on in this video, but some of this is clear. Twice per rest, action to use. It uses the term magically, which means it doesn't work in anti-magic. But here, a shape of a beast they've seen before. So if our characters fought some wolves a couple sessions ago, then wolf is clearly a form we can choose. What about a beast we've never encountered during gameplay? Might we have encountered it in our off time? We are a druid, and interacting with animals is on brand for druids. And what about just growing up? Which animals have we encountered? Is that something we can just add to our backstory when it's convenient for us? Like, hey, I just hit level 9 and I want to wild shape into a giant eagle. Um, yeah, I forgot to mention that my druid was a bird watcher and totally encountered giant eagles before. I think most DMs are pretty lenient on this one. You're a druid, so they figure you've probably encountered most animals somewhere along the way. Though, it's absolutely possible your DM could be a stickler here. It also gets into a very gray area if we're talking about beasts that might be from a specific campaign setting or a specific adventure path. Like, the Fastieth is from Eberron, and it's a common mount for halflings of the Talenta Plains. If you aren't playing in Eberron, maybe your DM lets this be an option for you, and maybe not. If it's a homebrew setting, it actually puts a lot of onus on the DM to decide exactly what animals from other settings exist in their worlds before maybe they'd want to do that. So, let's say in their world, they say there are no Fastieths. Then, they've kind of closed the door on themselves if they decide later that this creature would actually fit nicely into something they had planned. Now I'll tell you how I handle this one, because it's really not catastrophic. So what I'll do is at the start of a campaign, 
I will let the Druid player know exactly what sources they can use to access Wild Shape forms, and basically I assume they can do any of the forms from those sources. So this one could be a potential roadblock for a newer DM, but I think if you've played a while, just picking the sources at the beginning of the game is just an easy solution and it works well. Moving on, your Druid level determines the beasts you can transform into, as shown on the table. Basically, at second level, you can transform into a beast of challenge rating one quarter or lower that doesn't have a fly or swim speed. Then at fourth, you can transform into a beast of a challenge rating one half or lower, and now swim speed is okay. And then at level eight, up to challenge rating one, and the speed types of the form no longer an issue. And that's as far as it scales for normal druids. And this is a good time to jump ahead and talk about the moon druid. Because for most druids, wild shape is mostly a utility feature. For moon druids, it's intended to also be a combat option. So first off, moon druids can wild shape using a bonus action rather than an action. And if they want, they can expend spell slots while wild shaped to regain some hit points in their wild shape form. It's not a great conversion, d8 per spell level, but it's also a bonus action. So you can do it in the same turn that you're, say, attacking. The main thing is that moon druids can access more powerful forms. They can access a challenge rating one creature right at level two. So they start out at the challenge rating where the other druids finish up. Then they can increase this with levels. So they can access CR2 at level six, CR3 at level nine, CR4 at level 12, CR5 at level 15, and finally CR6 at level 18. They keep the same restrictions though for forms with swimming and flying speeds. So no swimming speeds until level four and no flying speeds until level eight. At 6th level, the Moon Druid's attacks are considered magical while wild shaped, and at level 10, they can use two uses of wild shape to transform into one of the four base elementals. They're all challenge rating 5, and I think they're arguably better than even challenge rating 6 beasts, so they might be your best form at any level. Then their level 14 ability has nothing to do with wild shape for some reason. So this stuff is all clear enough, let's go back to wild shape. So you can stay in your beast shape for a number of hours equal to half your druid level rounded down. Now that's pretty generous, that's already an hour at level 2, and after that you revert to your normal form unless you expend another use of wild shape. You can also revert to your normal form earlier if you use a bonus action, and you automatically revert if you fall unconscious, you drop to zero hit points, of course if you drop to zero hit points you're unconscious anyway, or you die. So this actually presents another gray area. Again, not the main one I'm going to be focusing on here, but what exactly does it mean by normal form? For example, if you cast the Shape Change spell, which is a druid spell, it says you retain the benefit of any features from your class, race, or other source, and you can use them. So let's say we're a wood elf moon druid. Then we cast Shape Change and change into a planetar. Then we use Wild Shape and transform into a mammoth. Then we take 126 points of damage. Do I revert to planetar form? because that's not my normal form. My normal form is a Wood Elf Druid. So if I revert to that, do I still have Shape Change? I guess that's what happens. You would revert to your Wood Elf Druid form and then can Shape Change again using your action, I suppose. Though that does have an unfortunate consequence, since right here it says that if your new form has more hit points than your current one, your hit points remain at their current value. So whatever hit points you had in your Wood Elf Druid form would be your new maximum. I'm just following what the feature and spell say, though I would think reverting to your planetar form probably would make more sense. This one really isn't a big problem. I mean, for me, I'm probably going to rule it to whatever makes the most sense for me. There's no official rule for what your normal form is, so it, your normal form could be the form you happen to be in before you used Wild Shape. Let's move on. Your game statistics are replaced by the statistics of the beast but you retain your alignment, personality, and intelligence, wisdom, and charisma scores. You also retain all of your skill and saving throw proficiencies in addition to gaining those of the creature. If the creature has the same proficiency as you and the bonus in its stat block is higher than yours, use the creature's bonus instead of yours. And you can't use any legendary stuff. So let's say you're level nine and you transform into a brown bear. Now this is gonna be confusing, but stay with me. So you need to make a dexterity saving throw. And let's say our normal form has a dexterity bonus of plus three. So what's our bonus? Well, the way I read it, if we aren't proficient in dexterity saving throws in our wood elf form, then we would have a plus zero because that using your own saving throw thing only applies to your proficiencies. 
All right, so let's say we took resilient dexterity. So now we're proficient. So now we can use the plus three. So I guess we just roll our normal dexterity saving throw, right? That should be a plus seven, plus three dexterity, and plus four from proficiency. At least how it's written, that is wrong. It says we keep the proficiency in dexterity saves, and it says we can use our own dexterity bonus, but it doesn't say anything about using our own proficiency bonus. There's nothing in Wild Shape that says we get to keep our own proficiency bonus. And it says, other than the exceptions listed, we're supposed to use the beast stat block. So at least as written, we should be using the proficiency bonus of the brown bear. Now here's a game for you. This is the brown bear entry from my monster manual. I've taken a picture of it. Where is the proficiency bonus? It is not listed anywhere. And now it should have a proficiency bonus in theory, but if we look at it, so let's say we're looking at our perception. We see we have a skill, perception plus three, Wisdom is a plus one modifier, so I guess our proficiency bonus is two. But just wait a minute. Take a look at that bite attack. Melee weapon attack, plus five to hit. Our strength modifier is plus four. You would think, plus four with a two proficiency bonus, that attack should be plus six. So we're supposed to use the proficiency bonus of the brown bear, but it is not clear from this entry what that proficiency bonus is. Is it plus two? Is it plus one? Is it something else? And there's no guidance to us whatsoever. Now on D&D Beyond, they update the books with errata. So I'm looking at the brown bear on my monster manual on D&D Beyond, and I can see that they have changed the bite and claw attacks to plus six. So now we can actually figure out that it is going to have a proficiency bonus of plus two. So I assume if you have a newer printing of the monster manual, then this is the entry that you would see. So you would be able to figure it out. It still doesn't list the proficiency bonus, though. Though there is an entry of Brown Bear on D&D Beyond that does list the proficiency bonus, but in the monster manual itself, it's just not there. And I believe, though I haven't checked every monster, of course, that you can use the number of hit dice, then cross-reference it to the proficiency bonus scaling of a player character, and it will match up. But figuring out what your bonus is for a skill you're proficient in or a saving throw you're proficient in means checking your base ability bonus, Comparing it to the beasts, then taking the higher of the two, then checking hit dice, then cross-reference that to a clash chart for proficiency bonus, then adding the two results together. Yeah, that's simple. So I understand how this one is supposed to work, at least as it's written, but I tend not to play it as it's written. So if I'm the DM and your character is a druid and you're wild-shaped, and then you have to make a skill check or saving throw for something you're proficient in, I'm just going to have you roll off your character sheet. It's not exact, but you know what? Close enough, and it just saves a bunch of time, and it's much easier. And so that's what I would probably recommend to my viewers is, yes, if we follow the minutia of the rules, you're supposed to use the proficiency bonus of the beast you're transformed into, but it's not worth the effort. It's close enough, just have them roll off their character sheet, and it works fine. So I do house rule this one a little bit, but it's not a big problem because it's an easy house rule. When you transform, you assume the beast hit points and hit dice. When you revert to your normal form, you return to the number of hit points you had before you transformed, but if you revert as a result of damage, any excess damage carries over to your normal form, and unless you're also reduced to zero hit points in your normal form, you remain conscious. So, we're an ice spider queen. We've taken some damage. We have five hit points left, and we're hit with 20 points of cold damage. But we have resistance to cold damage so we take half damage. The question would be, does that resistance apply to the carryover damage? And I believe it does. You apply the resistance and then apply the damage, so we should be applying to the whole works, even though some of the damage carried over to a form without that resistance. If you read it differently, let me know. But let's say we take a short rest in our Ice Spider Queen form and spend some hit dice. With a long duration of Wild Shape, this is totally possible to do. When we return to our normal form, are all those hit dice still considered expended? And I think I know the answer, and I think the answer is they're not considered expended. The way I read it, your hit dice and the hit dice of the beast you're wild shaped into are their own things. In Ice Spider form, you could expend these hit dice to recover these hit points, but not your hit points in your normal form, but you're also not expending hit dice from your normal form. 
It's a bit confusing, but I think we get a fairly satisfying answer here. So here's where it kind of gets interesting, though, is we are actually seeing more and more ways that the designers are trying to implement rules that allow you to use your hit dice in different ways. Um, but here's a classic, Dwarven Fortitude. Whenever you take the dodge action in combat, you can spend one hit die to heal yourself, roll the die, add your constitution modifier, and regain the number of hit points equal to the total. So if you were wild-shaped, then you could expend those hit dice to recover those hit points using Dwarven Fortitude. And then once they're used up, if you wild shape again, you could do it over again. And then once you're not wild shaped, you'd still have your own hit dice remaining. So that's just kind of a cool interaction. I don't think it creates any problems, at least so far. If they keep introducing new ways to use your hit dice, it could eventually become some kind of problem. But I think at this point, it isn't. Back to wild shape. You can't cast spells and your ability to speak or take any action that requires hands is limited to the capabilities of your beast form. Just going to stop there and point out that your inability to cast spells in Wild Shape doesn't say it's because of your inability to speak or use hand gestures. It's an addition. So when you have a subtle spell or something, you still can't cast spells in Wild Shape. I mean, until you can at super high level, because those are the 18th and 20th level Druid class features. Transforming doesn't break your concentration on a spell that you've already cast, though, or prevent you taking actions that are part of the spell you've already cast. This is fine. I mean, this is mostly fine, because even this one, and I know this isn't going to be a regular thing, but okay. So for example, we have cast Draw Midges Instant Summons before we Wild Shape into a Giant Constrictor Snake. So according to Draw Midges Instant Summons, we can use our action to speak the item's name, and it appears in our hands. Now, we can't speak as a giant constrictor snake, and we don't have hands, but it says right here, transforming doesn't prevent you taking actions that are part of a spell that we've already cast. So as it's written, the way I read it, transforming into a big snake shouldn't prevent us from speaking the item's name or having it appear in our non-existent hands because that's part of the action of a spell that we've already cast. I know I am being pedantic, so I am going to drop it. You know... Like I can drop things from my hands that exist. This one really isn't a problem. Just do what makes sense. Snakes don't talk. They don't have hands. So rules, schmools, it shouldn't work. I'm going to skip ahead to the last bullet point. You choose whether your equipment falls to the ground in your space, merges into your new form, or is worn by it. Worn equipment functions as normal, but the DM decides if it's practical for the new form to wear a piece of equipment based on the creature's size and shape. Your equipment doesn't change size or shape to match the new form, and any equipment that the new form can't wear must either fall to the ground or merge with it. Equipment that merges with the form has no effect until you leave the form. So my wood elf druid carries a staff, then I wild shape into an ape. The staff isn't worn, it's held. So at least the way this is written, it sounds like it must fall to the ground or be merged with the form. And that's a bit weird, but I mean, it's okay. Once again, it's just about the DM making rulings that make sense. So it, normally you're not transforming into something with hands, so it would make sense that the staff would drop to the ground. But if you are transforming into something that could probably hold a staff, so you just rule they can hold it. It doesn't matter whether the rules say specifically you can do that or not. So I've been pointing out some weird rules interactions here with Wild Shape, just because I think it's kind of interesting to look at exactly how the rules are written compared to what makes sense, and sometimes those things don't match up. But we're about to go over the part where I really have trouble, because here I don't even know what makes sense. So here we go. You retain the benefit of any features from your class, race, or other source, and can use them if the new form is physically capable of doing so. You know, unless it's dark vision, blind sight, or true sight. Now I could go over all kinds of things regarding class or benefits from other sources, but I'm not going to do that. Though I will point out one little brain teaser. So let's say you have a druid and you've cast true sight on yourself. Then you wild shape. Do you benefit from that true sight spell after you wild shape? Or is it one of those special senses exceptions? I'm not quite sure. I mean, I would probably allow the true sight spell to still be active when you're wild shaped, but you could read it the other way. And I just think that's kind of interesting. Let's talk about the one that's really hard to figure out. We're going to talk about our race, because that's where it gets super funky. 
we retain the benefits of our race if our new form is physically capable of doing so. Do you know how that works? Are you sure? Let's start with some easy ones. Can a halfling in wild shape use their lucky feature? I mean, I think obviously they can. There's no problems there. Is a satyr still resistant to magic when wild shaped? I think so. No problems there either. Can a wild shaped turtle benefit from their natural armor? I mean, obviously not. It says right here that it's your shell that provides the benefit. And if you're wild shaped, I mean, your shell is part of you and it's going to be transformed as the rest of you is into the new shape. It's gone, so there's no benefit. Unless you transformed into something with a shell, of course, then I guess you could. Can an Aarakocra benefit from their flight trait? I mean, I think obviously not. It says right here that it's your wings that provide the ability to fly. And once again, your wings are part of you and they're going to transform with you into the new shape. They're gone, so you have no benefit. Again, unless you transform into something with wings. So, so far, everything's reasonably clear. But those are the easy ones. Most racial features enter an area that is really gray. Rain clouds aren't this gray. For example, can the wild-shaped triton still breathe underwater? Does the wild-shaped dwarf still get poison resistance? What if it's a hill dwarf? Do they get the plus one hit points per hit die? Can the wild-shaped heron gone do a rabbit hop? All of these features are probably based on the anatomy of these creatures, though it's not specified in the trait itself that it relies on anatomy. Is a brown bear physically capable of being resistant to poison? The question makes no sense. Like, if the dwarf's resistance is because dwarves are just built in a physiologically more resistant way, and then they transform into a vanilla brown bear, then you would think they wouldn't. But maybe the bear form gains that physiology as well. So a brown bear form for a dwarf druid might just be a little more hardy than a brown bear form for a human druid. Maybe. The rule doesn't make it clear how we're supposed to handle this. So naturally, I did some digging. And I did find something. This is a five-year-old tweet, but it does cover the issue we're talking about. So this one kind of broke me. The question is whether a Wood Elf's fleet of foot feature, which increases the Wood Elf's base walking speed to 35 feet, would apply when wild shaped. Now, I think we could probably agree that your walking speed is obviously, at least in part, based on your anatomy. It's not random that snails move slow. They move slow because of the anatomy they use to move. So you would think that, obviously, a Wood Elf wild shaped into a snail isn't going to have a walking speed of 35 feet. That's not what Jeremy Crawford says. What Jeremy Crawford says is that since fleet of foot doesn't specify that it's based on anatomy, and because it's a racial trait, it technically works with wild shape, but it's the DM's call. So if we look at the Aarakocra flight trait, it's actually written in the feature. Because of your wings, you have a flying speed. So it doesn't work with wild shape because it specifies the anatomy. But if we look at fleet of foot, it doesn't specify anatomy anywhere in the trait. Same can be said of traits that might be based on anatomy, like Dragonborn's Breath Weapon, Tiefling's Fire Resistance, the aforementioned Triton and Breathing Underwater, and I could go on. These are all probably based on anatomy, but none of them say they are based on anatomy. So at least according to this relatively old tweet, technically they should work, but it's the DM's call. And the DM is only given one tool to make that call. Is the form physically capable of doing so? But that's not really a tool because it doesn't make sense. They have to decide in their own mind how racial features interact with wild shape. And there is a very good chance they've never taken that exercise before. Here's a little game you can play to confuse your DM. And I am only including this for humor's sake. Don't actually do this. You could show them the wild shape rules, specifically the part about racial features and being physically capable and special senses, then ask if your upcoming Triton Druid will retain their ability to breathe underwater. I think the average DM would say something like, sure, why not? Then show them the artwork and point out the gills, then ask again. We often don't know how unclear a rule is until we're in the position of figuring out how the rule is supposed to work. Watch your DM read the wild shape rules over and over, mumbling, how the hell is this supposed to work? Then, when they're in the process of trying to figure it out, point out the tweet and say, oh, I just found this tweet. 
I guess Jeremy Crawford says, if it doesn't specify the anatomy in the feature, then I'm good to go. Your DM's going to be so relieved. Okay, so you can breathe underwater with your Triton Druid because that feature doesn't specify anatomy. I guess whatever form you take just happens to have the gills too. Then you can say, actually, I changed my mind on race. I was going to play a Triton, but I've decided instead to play an Autonome. Now I can be healed by mending spells in my wild shape form using my beast form's hit dice and watch their head explode. Again, never ever do that. So in conclusion, I don't know how this is supposed to work. I don't understand how my wood elf druid transforms into a snail and walks 35 feet per round. I don't get it. But you know what? If I suspend disbelief, then Jeremy Crawford's ruling kind of works. Well enough, I guess. Autonome druids can heal themselves in wild shape with mending because maybe they're kind of robot beasts or something. Herongon druids can use their hop when they're wild shaped into a mammoth. Don't ask me how. Tabaxi druids can use feline agility to double their speed. Whatever. I mean, it's easier than the alternative because there's no clear place to draw the line here. At what point do racial features not interact with your wild shape anymore? Not physically capable of doing so doesn't answer that question for us. So we have to draw the line somewhere. So whether or not the feature mentions the anatomy, there is a line. So that's probably the one I'll use. It's the one Jeremy Crawford suggests, and it doesn't always make sense. But I'm not sure where exactly you draw that line, where it always does make sense. Because this is just that one thing about Wild Shape. I have no idea how it is supposed to work, I don't even know if the designers know how it's supposed to work, and I kind of doubt you know how it's supposed to work either, but I could be wrong. If I am, let me know in the comments. Tell me how it is supposed to work, where exactly that line is supposed to be drawn. Otherwise, until next time, I am going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody, and I'll talk to you soon.